Hey YouTube, welcome back to the Fantasy Football Profits. As always, we thank you guys so much for being here. Me and Ryan, we're really excited to bring you guys another video. And today, we're really excited particularly about this video. We're going to be doing over-under on uh, four players each. And uh, that's really exciting because we'll talk about key stats or where guys are ranked. And basically, are they going to go above that or below that? That sounds really simple, but especially with the stats, that really makes or breaks their fantasy value. And then with their rankings, for example, we, we're going to do Robbie Anderson ranks 24th overall. Is that an over and under? Well, then, of course, that'll tell you where should I draft him? How do I value him? So it's actually extremely important. It's also fun for us because... We get to talk about guys that we're interested in talking about. Sometimes if we do just a running back video, then you run out of interesting guys to talk about that you really care about. But we can really nitpick and just talk about the guys that we're excited about. So uh, that's very interesting. We're excited about that. As always, we tell you guys to go check out our Instagram and our Facebook. Go to our website if you want to get more information about these guys, more stats. You can check out our research page and our daily posts. Um, but uh, yeah, so that's what we're going to do. We're going to get right into it now. Uh, we might as well not waste any more time. We can start uh, talking about our first player here. All right, Ryan, so you're talking first. You have quarterback Tyrod Taylor, and your over-under prompt is Tyrod Taylor ranks 15th among quarterbacks. What do you have to say? I have a lot to say about Tyrod Taylor. First of all, with this guy, there are plenty of pros and cons when it comes to Tyrod Taylor. This guy's been in the league for seven years now. This will be his eighth season. He's kind of a veteran at this point, but for the first three seasons of his career, he was hit or miss. He didn't really have a full 16-game season. In fact, in his entire career, he's never started for a full 16-game season. In 2014, he actually had zero starts. He only recorded negative three yards rushing, no pass attempts. 2015, 16, 17, he comes out, finally breaks through. He is the starter for the Buffalo Bills. The thing is, with every season that he's been there, his highest statistical season for passing yards, 3,035 yards in 2015. The positives on him, he doesn't turn the ball over. He doesn't make mistakes. He's a rushing quarterback. He can get you yards on the ground, get you yards with his legs. He's getting those rushing touchdowns, and he's not getting you negative points with the fumbles and the interceptions. But there are some negatives too. He doesn't get a lot of passing yards. 3,035 as a total is under 200 yards a game as an average for a quarterback. I just do not like that as a stat, especially in my fantasy leagues. Um, with the running, Buffalo has always been kind of a run first team. Now he's moving on, he's in Cleveland. They're gonna have some options there. They have a lot of weapons and they're gonna look to him to throw the ball. Well, with Cleveland, the Browns, they have Josh Gordon. He's going to be stretching the field. He's only 27 years old. He's an explosive player. He hasn't played a lot in his career, but I think he's going to turn the corner now and be there for a full 16-game season. They just signed Jarvis Landry. That guy, in the first four seasons, he has the NFL record for the most receptions with 400. So he's, he's catching a lot of balls, getting a lot of targets. They have Nick Chubb coming out of the backfield, Carlos Hyde, Duke Johnson, and David Njoku. Also the rookie, Antonio Callaway. He's seeming to to move up the charts. So a lot of targets to go around. If they look to have Tyrod Taylor throwing the ball, that should be a lot of passing yards. But the problem is he doesn't ever keep on the field. Always throughout his career, he's found a way to lose the starting job for at least one game, possibly even two to these kind of uh, trashy scrubs. I mean, look at last year, Nathan Peterman, the Bills saw him as the better quarterback in practice. He came out through five interceptions against the Chargers. They had to bring back in Tyrod Taylor, and he came in and finished out the game. But to have a guy like Nathan Peterman uh, look better than you in practice, I mean, yeah, we can say that's just practice, the old Allen Iverson quote, but there's got to be something wrong there. And Baker Mayfield, number one overall pick in the draft, is just sitting behind him waiting to get his chance. Now, another statistic for you. In the 23 quarterbacks that have been drafted in the modern era, there's only one quarterback that has not started in his rookie season at least one game of the number one overall picks, and that was Carson Palmer in 2013. So 21 out of 22 of the last 22 have at least started in their rookie season, and I think Baker Mayfield is going to have a chance to start at some point this season. So Tyrod Taylor has the rushing ability. He doesn't turn the ball over, but he doesn't throw a lot of touchdowns, doesn't throw a lot of uh, passing yards. So I just don't foresee him getting the fantasy points to get you within that top 15. Yeah, that's solid research. Um, one thing I'd say, he, with his legs, he keeps teams guessing. He's got hands down more weapons than he's ever had. In fact, 
that receiving core, if you especially if you include David Njoku, who's mm-hmm. a tight end, but he still catches the ball. Mm-hmm. So, you know, what do you call it? But um, definitely one of the best situations he's ever been in. But you're absolutely right. You know, they drafted Baker Mayfield for a reason. So he might not finish with a really great fantasy ranking, but the games that Tyrod Taylor is going to start, he could be a great plug-and-play, especially with the right matchup. Absolutely. It's going to be matchup dependent, but if he can't finish all 16 games, now let's say he does. If he finishes all 16 games, I definitely can foresee him being in the top 15, maybe even top 12 as a quarterback. He's going to do some things with the legs. He's going to extend plays. He's going to let guys like Josh Gordon get open. But the thing is, will he play all 16? And I just can't guarantee that's going to happen as of right now. All right, exactly. Well, that's pretty solid. I don't have much to say on that. I suppose I'll move on and talk about my guy now. All right, so wide receiver Doug Baldwin. Um, I actually just talked about him in my Dark Horse video, so sorry I talked about him in two videos. If you haven't seen that, go check it out. Talk about some other guys, so that's really fun. But uh, here's the prompt. Doug Baldwin, top 10 or the, excuse me, the 10th ranked wide receiver in standard leagues. And I'm actually going to say over. Now, I'm going to say barely over, like 8, 9, or even just tie for 10. Uh, and that's just because it's so competitive that that'd be very hard to do much more than that. I don't think he's going to be top five. But the 5'10", 192-pound wide receiver for Seattle has been great over the last three seasons. <clears throat> he's finished in the top 13 in fantasy receivers and standard league scoring all three years. He's averaged 82 receptions on 115 targets, 1,062 yards, and 9.7 touchdowns a year. Those numbers are really great, but there's even better news. The fact that Paul Richardson and Jimmy Graham left in the offseason is huge. Together last year, they combined for 178 targets, 1,200 yards, and 16 touchdowns. That's huge, um, especially because the Seattle Seahawks didn't bring anyone in to replace them. So really excited to see what he can do now, where all those targets, almost 200 targets, 16 touchdowns, over 1,000 yards, has to go somewhere. What's going to go to their number one wideout, Russell Wilson's number one target, hands down, Doug Baldwin. There's some even better news about that, though. Um, the Seattle Seahawks are terrible now on defense. They lost Richard Sherman, Michael Bennett, Sheldon Richardson, and Deshaun Sheed. Uh, Deshaun Sheed was actually, a lot of people don't know about him, but not last year, but the year before he was even a starter. And last year he came off the bench and did a lot of work for them. So they've lost a ton of talent on the defensive side. Um, let alone the fact that last year they really struggled on defense because of injuries. And we saw what happened. Russell Wilson had to be Superman. Plenty of fourth quarter comebacks and so many stats late in games because they're down all the time. Well, that plays really well into Doug Baldwin's style of wide receiver. I don't know why, but for whatever reason, the later in the game, the further they're down, the better Doug Baldwin gets as a wideout. In the fourth quarter in overtime, when Doug Baldwin's thrown to, he generates a quarterback passer rating of 144.5. That's best in the NFL. Uh, when trailing, he has 38 receptions, 504 yards, and 7 touchdowns. And in the third and the fourth quarter, he has 38 catches, 580 yards, and 7 TDs. I think that he could have an absolute monster year. I would not be surprised at all if he finished within the top 10 for fantasy wide receivers in standard league scoring. It's a bit of a stretch to say that in a PPR league because he's never been a huge PPR guy. But he could definitely do it this year. He has averaged 82 catches, which isn't necessarily bad. Um, and those extra targets could put him up into the 90s range, which would then certainly make that possible. But that's a bit more of a stretch for me than in a standard league. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with that. Top 10. Um, I actually was paying attention in Minneapolis over the, se- the weekend with the Fantasy Sports Trade Show. And a lot of guys are really high on Doug Baldwin. <coughs> he's, um, he's going high in a lot of drafts. There's a lot of targets to be had. Russell Wilson's going to be chucking the ball. That offensive line isn't very good. He's going to be scrambling. And like we talked about with Tyrod Taylor, scrambling quarterbacks are going to give guys time to get open. So I do really like Rashad Penny there. Hopefully that offensive line can hold up for a running game. But, you know, losing guys like Jimmy Graham, like you said, and, um, you know, Tyler Lockett's really the only other guy there that really is a threat to get any of those targets, which you can find him on our... um, wide receiver rankings video yeah and that's just the thing that you talk about you bring in a rookie running back and a wide receiver who last year was number three on the depth chart in fact he was behind paul richardson who clearly they don't seem too impressed with tyler lockett he might be a solid sleeper this year but he's clearly not a dominant wide receiver 
I don't think that there's anyone on that team that's a threat to take targets from him. Definitely not Brandon Marshall. In fact, let's be honest. Any more targets that the other guys get is only going to help Doug Baldwin mm-hmm. because none of those guys are going to go out and get over 100 targets. None of those guys are going to go out and get 1,000 yards and 10 touchdowns. I mean, this is really the Russell Wilson, the Doug Baldwin show. In fact, for Doug Baldwin's sake, I'm hoping those other guys step up because that will actually help him. Mm-hmm. That will bring off some attention, but he's going to be a big volume play this year for sure. Yeah, exactly. Well, we'll move on. I think that about sums it up. We'll talk about your next guy, Ryan. All right, so Sammy Watkins, what's your over-under for 1,000 yards this year? Sammy Watkins, I have Sammy Watkins, my over-under is 1,000 yards, and I'm going to go over 1,000, definitely over. Now, if you look at Sammy Watkins, we're going to go back and take a look at his career. He started out as a rookie with the Buffalo Bills. He's never really had a solid quarterback situation. Ryan Fitzpatrick was probably... Uh, you know, we just talked about Tyrod Taylor, but he had Ryan, guys like Ryan Fitzpatrick throwing to him. Tyrod Taylor last year, Jared Goff, but he was the third option, realistically, on that offense. Maybe even the fourth option behind Cooper Cup, Todd Gurley, and Robert Woods. So he didn't have great situation there at the Rams. And um, now this year he moves on to Kansas City. He's going to have Tyreek Hill on one side. He's going to be on the other side. He's not really the guy that's going to stretch the field, although he can. But there's also Travis Kelsey and Kareem Hunt that are going to get some targets out of the backfield there. Well, with um, Sammy Watkins, they bring in Patrick Mahomes. This guy, they traded away a number one fantasy quarterback last season for at least the first six or seven weeks in Alex Smith. And they say, we're going to put all of our money on this Patrick Mahomes guy. He had a decent one game (laughs) i know it's only a small sample size but the one game he played 282 yards 22 of 35 passing but in practice and in uh mini camps and otas he's been able to show that he can toss the ball all over the field he can throw it 40 50 yards from his knees he can chuck it 85 yards in the air this guy has an absolute monster of an arm now sammy watkins career his highest reception total is 65 in his in his rookie season 65 for 982 Season two, he comes out and has only 13 games, 60 catches, but he did make over 1,000 yards that year, 1,047. Um, He had some injury problems, hurt the foot, came back 2016, did not play very many games. He only played half the season. He had 28 catches for 430 yards. And then last season, like I said, with the Rams, he was maybe the fourth option there on that offense, 39 catches for 593. Here's the thing, you break those numbers down. What does it take to get to 1,000 yards? 1,000 yards over 16 games, you're looking at 62.5 yards per game. With Sammy Watkins, if you take down his career numbers, he averages 15.9 yards per catch. At 15.9 yards per catch, he would need 64 receptions to break 1,000 yards. Now, yes, he's only had 64 catches one time in his career. That was his rookie season. But like I said, season two, he would have had that had he had the full 16 game load, but he was injured. Season three, he was injured. Season four, he was the number four option. So going to Kansas City, he's moving up in the depth chart. He's the number two wide receiver to look at, possibly even the number one, depending on how people view Tyreek Hill. And Sammy Watkins is going to be able to hit that 62-yard mark per game. And he's probably going to break his uh, personal best 65 receptions this season. So I'm looking at Sammy Watkins maybe around the 11 to 1,200-yard range and probably 65 to 75 catches this year. Yeah, I think that's solid research. I have to agree with you. When you look at it, what he did last year was really impressive because he was, I would say he was essentially the fourth option. Mm-hmm. Now, Patrick Mahomes is good, is no Jared Goff, and that's no Sean McVay's offense. That offense was really good last year, and I don't mm-hmm. expect that from the Chiefs. But I don't think that we need that for Sammy Watkins to come out and have 1,000 yards because, like I said, he was essentially the fourth option behind Robert Woods, Cooper Cup, and um, Todd Gurley. And Todd Gurley, thank you. And so I think that that bodes really well for him. My only concern is that they let him go and that he's on his third team in three years. Buffalo didn't want him. The Rams didn't want him. Now the Chiefs are picking him up. It almost makes me wonder, is there something these other teams know about him that we don't? Um, cause you're right. He hasn't had a whole lot of catches throughout his career, but he's not one of those guys. He's a, he's not one of those big catches guys, not a big volume guy. In fact, like you said, 
he gets a lot more yards per catch than most right. wide receivers. So that really bodes well for him, especially with an inexperienced quarterback. In fact, I think the biggest detriment this season to Sammy Watkins' stats would honestly be if the defense played well and the running game was effective. The best thing you could have happen is a terrible defense and a bad running game and force them to throw the ball a ton. I don't know how much Patrick Mahomes' play is actually going to affect Sammy Watkins. Because if Sammy or because if uh, Patrick Mahomes plays well, then he's effectively getting the ball to Sammy Watkins and good for him. And if he plays bad, then they're losing games and they need to throw the ball more. So I don't know if that's my biggest concern with Watkins this year. You know, I don't think they really did a whole lot to upgrade that defense. And the defense, let's frankly, was just bad last season. Um, there were a lot of games where the number one corner on the Kansas City Chiefs was giving up tons of yardage to the number one wide receiver on the opposite team. I mean, you look at that one game outlier of Amari Cooper last year, he had over 200 yards and like 12 catches. That was against the Kansas City Chiefs. The one game that um, Demarius Thomas actually broke out after having such a down season was against the Kansas City Chiefs. Keenan Allen exploded against Kansas City Chiefs. So it's just that that defense was bad. They lost um, Peters this year to the Rams. So I don't know how much they've upgraded their defense and that could help Mahomes and the offense in the throwing situations. But also in the 20 seasons that Andy Reid's been a head coach, he's always been known as a quarterback guru. And if Andy Reid lets go of a guy that's as smart as Alex Smith, now Jay um, Gruden has come out and said in the, the weeks that he's been with Alex Smith, he's the smartest person he's ever met behind himself or something like I believe the quote was so Alex Smith is such a smart quarterback and Andy Reid lets him go to bring in the second year guy Patrick Mahomes they moved up in the draft to get him so I think he's going to be able to find a way to get the ball to Watkins and like you mentioned he doesn't need a lot of receptions to get to that thousand yard mark because of the the yards per catch number that I threw out there so I think that just bodes well for Watkins this season all right, well, that's a solid pick. I completely agree with that for sure. Let's move on and talk about our next guy. Now I'm up and I'm gonna so now I'm up and I'm gonna talk about wide receiver Robbie Anderson. So the prompt for him or the over under is that he will rank 24th among wide receivers in standard league scoring. And I'm gonna say over. Now that's basically on the cusp of being a wide receiver three or a wide receiver two, ranking in at 24th. Um, last year he actually ranked 20th so if he can basically if he can do what he did last year then he'll already but I imagine he'll even take further steps forward he had 63 receptions on 114 targets 941 yards and seven touchdowns um, a lot of people were surprised to find out that he didn't uh, do better than that that he didn't pass a thousand yards considering during a six game stretch he had three 100 yard games and six touchdowns he was on fire and really developing into a top NFL wide receiver. And then he really struggled the last four games of the season, leaving many people to wonder, what's wrong? Is he really a legitimate wide receiver or not? Well, I'm going to say yes, he is. And here's what happened. During the last game of that final stretch, he played great. Boom, he was fine. He went off into practice. And between weeks, on a Thursday practice, he hurt his hamstring and really struggled. And, and really struggled with it the rest of the season. Uh, he also had a really tough schedule. First, he played Denver, who was the fourth best pass defense all last season. And at this point, they had just gotten Akib to lead back. They were already doing really well and already up there among pass defenses. And then they get their number one cornerback, which is just huge. Um, so he struggles in that game. And then he goes and plays the Saints and plays Marshawn Lattimore, who was effectively the second best corner in the NFL last year, only yeah. allowing only allowing 41.8 passer rating when thrown his way. I mean, that's really tough to compete with. What a great cornerback. Then he goes and plays the Chargers, who are the third best pass defense. And then he plays the Patriots. Um, and he makes one reception before leaving the game because he re-pulls his hamstring or whatever happened um, and was unable to keep playing. So um, being that he ranked 20th last year and he really struggled and played four games, pretty banged up, it took him a while to kind of get into his role. I wouldn't be surprised if he passed 1,000 yards and had eight touchdowns. Um, I'm thinking about 75 receptions, 1,000 yards, eight TDs is something what I'm expecting from him, maybe even a little bit more. So I absolutely have to go over on this pick. Those numbers sound about right for Robbie Anderson. You know, he's really confusing for me. Like you said, last year he had such a great stretch, and then right after that, you know, the hamstring issue. I think those three defenses that you mentioned, actually you mentioned four of them, but Denver, 
New Orleans with Lattimore, and then the Chargers are three really difficult guys to play against as a number one receiver against a number one corner. Um, he's probably right around that cusp, like you said, wide receiver two, wide receiver three, depending on the size of your league. But the only question I would have for you is, what do you think about the Terrell Pryor situation? Well, you know, that's the thing. Um, I think some people are concerned that Terrell Pryor is going to come in and that he's going to steal catches away. First of all, I don't care what team you are in the NFL. When you have a bad run game and a bad defense, there's room for two wideouts. Mm. There's room for both of them, honestly, to have 1,000 yards and 10 touchdowns apiece. Sure. Um, there absolutely is. For me, the bigger concern is possibly the quarterback play. As far as Terrell Pryor goes, in fact, he really struggled last year. The year before, he was good, but he struggled last year. I don't imagine that he's going to come in and dominate. Uh, it's <clears throat> it's kind of like I said earlier when you talked about Sammy Watkins. Um the better he plays, honestly, is probably going to only benefit Robbie Anderson sure. more. Um, again, I don't see that as a real concern. Do you see that as a concern as far as... You know, he came in as a, a converted quarterback, so I don't really know. You know, he's had that one great season, and that like that's got to be the anomaly out of the whole situation. I feel like Terrell Pryor, he's getting up there in age. He's not as young as he used to be. Uh, you know, had a shaky season last year with the Redskins. Like you mentioned with Watkins, three teams in three years. He went from the Browns to the Redskins and now to the Jets. So maybe there's other things that we don't know there. I don't foresee him having any real negative effects on Robbie Anderson this year. It's not like he's going to overtake him as the best receiver on that team. Um, Jermaine Curse maybe could get a few looks, but I think it's going to be pretty similar to the range that you're talking. I just don't know. Um, personally, I just I, I haven't really done a lot of research on Robbie Anderson, so I'm I, I really love the numbers that you brought up, and I was shocked to hear that he finished at number 20 last year, considering it was only like a six or seven game stretch. So if he finished that last year in only basically half a season, I think he could definitely increase on those numbers and improve this year. Yeah, well, you know, I think the best case scenario for him is that they put in Teddy Bridgewater at quarterback. <laughs> I think my biggest concern is that they put in the rookie quarterback they drafted, Sam Darnold. That's my biggest concern. Um they have a tendency to do that, and that that's a worry for me. I think with, with Teddy, everybody's got such great high hopes on Teddy, and nobody realizes how long it's actually been since he's played an NFL game. Um, with, with three potential week one starting quarterbacks on that team, I think maybe they're just looking for a trade option. <laughs> you know, maybe, maybe another team loses a guy and they need a backup. Maybe another team is... Uh, you know, Teddy's only signed for 500000 guaranteed at $6 million over the course of the season if he stays on the team. So, um, you know, it's easy to drop him and not have any real uh, monetary concerns. So he's either trade bait or he's droppable if he doesn't perform throughout the preseason. So I don't I don't foresee him. I mean, that, that, could, that could help out the passing game uh, because he's got a, a giant arm, but I think they drafted Darnold for a reason. Well, uh, like I said, um, the other thing is if they put McCown in, that would also be good because that was the quarterback last year, and that's yeah. what he was able to work with. They clearly work well with each other. Sure. Again, worst-case scenario is that Sam Darnold plays. Honestly, that's it for me. Maybe Sam Darnold's a lot better than I think, but honestly, I haven't been impressed with him, especially rookie quarterback in a not great situation. But uh, I think that about sums it up. I think yeah. you're going to talk about your next guy now. Sound good? Yep, it does. All right. I'm ready. All right, Ryan. So why don't you tell us about Cooper Cup? Now you're over under. Here's the question: ranks 20th among wide receivers over or under, Ryan. Cooper Cup. Now Cooper Cup, I foresee very similar to the last two guys we spoke about. We're on a wide receiver kick here. This is four guys in a row. Cooper Cup and Robbie Anderson, I foresee being around the same range. Um, last year, Cooper Cup finished number 24 at wide receiver with 62 catches for. 892 yards and five touchdowns, 869 yards and five touchdowns, I'm sorry. Um, <clears throat> once again, Cooper Cup is one of those guys that's kind of right around the fringe of wide receiver two, wide receiver three range, depending on your league size. I think that inside the top 20 is a possibility for him, but um, for the verdict on this video, I'm going to go outside the top 20, and these are the reasons. Cooper Cup is playing on that Rams offense. Now, they got rid of Sammy Watkins. They bring in Brandon Cooks. And to me, that's kind of a lateral move. 
Those two guys are basically the same player at this point in their career. Sammy Watkins can do what he does, and Brandon Cooks does basically the same thing. They still have Robert Woods on the opposite side. That guy's going to command a lot of targets. He's going to have that connection with Jared Goff. Todd Gurley's going to be catching a lot of balls coming out of the backfield. Now, you hear this every single year, that the running back is working on his hands. Now, if he's continuing to work on his hands after as many receptions as he had last year and as many receiving yards, it's only going to add more targets for him. So that's going to reduce targets for those three wide receivers. Um, Brandon Cooks is there. Woods is there. Cooper Cup is probably the number two wide receiver, um, potentially even the number three. But realistically, it could fall down to the fourth best passing option. Now, Jared Goff and that Sean McVay offense, they lost Matt LaFleur to the Titans. Now, I don't know if it's Sean McVay that runs the system or Matt LaFleur that was running the system, but the Rams offense was definitely a run heavy last year. They're the 24th highest pass attempts. Now, that means only eight teams in the NFL fell behind them in pass attempts last season. So they do run the ball quite heavily. They don't pass a whole lot. Jared Goff is going to be very efficient. But the question is, with all those guys to spread the ball to, how many of those targets are going to go to Cooper Cup? I know that they like him there. He's in his second season only. He had a pretty solid rookie season, 62 catches. I mean, I, I can see him increasing on that. He's going to increase on his numbers for yardage. But with all of the wide receivers that are going to be increasing their numbers this year, I think he's going to fall right in that same range around 23 to 25 for wide receivers and just fall outside the top 20. Definitely draft this guy, but I don't think that he's a top 20 wide receiver this year. All right, solid input. Um, one thing that I'd like to note, um, and I might bump him up in, my only disagreement with you is that you say you think he's going to be the number two wide receiver, possibly the number three. I'm going to call him the number two wide receiver, possibly the number one. Oh. And here's why. They went out last year. They have Todd Gurley. They went out and get Robert Woods. They have Sammy Watkins. And they draft Cooper Cup. Well, if you watch some of our other videos, you know what I think of Cooper Cup. Oh, I yeah. love the guy. His combine reviews were insane. <clears throat> and I think that they were on, and I think that it was his rookie year, and he was kind of buried on the depth chart, but I think that he's going to be the number one guy. If you look at Robert Woods' career, last year was his career year. He really struggled years past, and I think that was a bit of an anomaly. I think that was even better than the Rams expected. I wouldn't be surprised if Cooper Cup took over. Now I'll check this because I'm not sure if this is, I'm not sure exactly the numbers on this, but if I'm not mistaken, um, Cooper Cup had the most red zone targets out of anyone on the Rams. Of course, besides, <clears throat> of course, besides Todd Gurley, who's the running back who gets to run it and receive in the red zone. But sure. um, uh, down in the description, I'll put his numbers. I'll check to make sure that right. But if I'm not mistaken, that's correct. So I definitely think he could be the guy. I also think it bodes well that they switch from Watkins to Cook. I mean, here's why. I think that it's a slight downgrade to go from Watkins to Cook. I mean, first of all, you look at the Patriots. They have basically no wide receivers now. Their best guy is suspended for four games and isn't a great fantasy option anyways in Julian Edelman. And yet they're still willing to let uh, Cooks go. And I have some concerns with him. Another thing is the way that he plays. He's just a deep ball threat. He's just a speedster. He's not a great route runner. He doesn't have fantastic hands. So I think that Cooper Cup could be the number one wideout this year. Maybe that's a stretch. But worst thing that happens in my mind is he's number two. Yeah, that's a kind of a bold prediction there. <clears throat> All right. Well, I think that about sums it up. We might as well move on, and I can say something dumb about the next guy, too, and make more stupid bold predictions. Oh, but uh, I think that's a great next video, bold predictions. All right. I got a few. <clears throat> All right, so now I'm going to talk about Deshaun Watson, and here's the prompt. This one was probably the easiest prompt for me, and that's Deshaun Watson will throw 30 touchdowns, and I'm under on that one. Let's talk about it. First of all, one of the main reasons he was able to do that, uh, was able to do what he did last year, he was phenomenal. In fact, he had, threw for 19 touchdowns in like six to eight games or whatever, just first half of the season. Um, the first reason he was able to do that, first of all, he comes on as a rookie, and defenses always struggle against rookies simply because they haven't seen them and they don't have much film against them. Um, so that's one thing. They've had a lot, a lot, a lot of time to get used to what Deshaun Watson does. I think that's good news. Other pieces of, uh, I think that's bad news, excuse me for him. Other pieces of bad news is that he's in a, 
fairly tough division as far as the fact he's got to play the Jaguars twice and he has to play um, the Titans twice, who are both fairly good defenses. Of course, the Jaguars are really good, and the Titans are actually above average, which I think surprises some people. They're not far above average. Yeah, I'm not going to talk them up too much. Of course, the Colts' defense is bad, but right there you get four tough games. Um, another thing that's huge is that he was throwing the ball a ton. That running game was extremely ineffective last year, and that defense was even worse. The Texans' defense ranked last in the NFL as far as points per game. They gave up 27.3 points per game, practically just begging Deshaun Watson to be an NFL MVP had he played the whole year because, man, they were giving him the ball so much. <clears throat> the defense is not going to be that bad this year, and I think that's one thing that's going to hold Deshaun Watson back. They added Tyron Matthew, and we'll have J.J. Watt healthy. Watt only played five games last year, and, of course, one of those games he got hurt, and so basically only played four games. So I think that those are two pieces of news that are really going to help Deshaun Watson. In, um, they're really not going to help Deshaun Watson. They're going to withhold him. They're not going to ask him to do as much. Um, again, we want to talk about how important is it that he gets a lot of stats from that. Well, 700 yards and 10 of his touchdowns plus 600 yards and si uh, excuse me, when trailing, he has 700 passing yards and 10 touchdowns. So over half of his touchdowns come when they're losing. 600 yards and six touchdowns come in just the fourth quarter. Um, so I think that that's a major concern for me. Another thing is that a lot of people have a tendency to think that sophomore slump isn't a real thing. It definitely is, and here's why. <clears throat> I wanted to look over the last few years and see if I could find any. I know that this is a very controversial thing. It is, it is, and people are all over the place. And I'm going to say at quarterback position, I definitely think it is. So here are some guys from the last few seasons who have struggled. Sam Bradford, uh, he went out and... Passed for 3,500 yards and 18 touchdowns on 60% completion percentage his rookie year. His sophomore year, he comes out, barely passes 2,000 yards and six touchdowns on 53.5% completion percentage. Yikes. Huge drop off. Other guys who struggled and had sophomore slumps, Matt Ryan, RG3, Matthew Stafford, Sam Bradford. Dak Prescott. Dak Prescott. There's another great example. Um, there are plenty of guys. The list just goes on. I'm not going to name too many of them for you. But the quarterbacks who specifically struggle with that are running quarterbacks. Now, Cam Newton really improved his second year. He didn't necessarily have a drop-off fantasy-wise, but he had a huge drop-off in his running game. He went from 14 rushing touchdowns his rookie year to eight, almost cut that in half in one year. And so I expect the same sort of thing to happen to Deshaun Watson, where I don't think he's going to be nearly as effective in the running game, which is a huge problem if you... This one isn't really quantifiable in stats. You have to have watched Deshaun Watson in-game last year. Countless third and fourth downs and second downs, they would wide receivers would go out and run routes, and Deshaun Watson would take off and make a huge play with his legs. He's not going to be able to do that this year. After his injury last season, defense is learning a little bit about him and understanding how to cover that. I think he's going to take a major step back in that area, which is certainly going to hurt his effectiveness in the passing game. I know that these are lots of little reasons against him, and no, not any one reason is huge, but 30 touchdowns is a lot, so I think he's definitely going to come shy of that. And think about it, even quarterback Matthew Stafford only had 29 last season, so I'm going under. Amazing. Yeah, Matthew Stafford was amazing last year, and you know to only have 29 touchdowns. Um, the thing with the defense, a couple of big names that, that we didn't really touch on were um, they have Merciless in the in the um, the front line there, and then they also drafted Justin Reed, Eric Reed's uh, younger brother in the secondary. And this guy, as one of the top probably three or four um, coverage guys in the entire draft, came out and was drafted in the second round. These Texans are going to actually have a great defense this year. You know, J.J. Watt missed 24 games out of the last two seasons. 24 out of 32, that's a huge chunk of games to miss. And now he's coming back, hopefully fully healthy. You got Clowney, Watt, you got Merciless, Reed. Um, you said Honey Badger's there. So that defense is going to be much improved. That offensive line is absolutely inefficient. And as NFL.com ranked them, one of the, the worst three offensive lines in football. So um, hopefully Watson's... Not going to be coming out there, running the ball around, getting taking a lot of hits. Um, I know he's working right now without a brace, so that's a good thing. But once it, that's just in shorts and a helmet, so we'll see what happens once all the full pads get on and they're going with contact. But um, 30 touchdowns, like you said, is a lot to hit, and I don't think that he's going to hit that. Now, if it was a cumulative total, 
I might say maybe 24 touchdowns, maybe even six on the ground if he can figure out how to, to break free, but it's uh, it's not. It's just passing touchdowns, so I'm going to go with under as well. Yeah, exactly. He'll definitely have some uh, some rushing touchdowns. Well, one more thing I'll add, and then we can move on. <clears throat> I think a lot of people think, well, if he's effective in the running game, the coaches will let him keep running it. They're not going to do that. This guy comes out last year, and he's lights out, and he's amazing. And he seems to be the future of the franchise. You're not going to let him go out and continue to injure himself and break himself and not be around to help your team. They're definitely going to rein him in. However, I think because he's going to play probably twice as many games this coming season, he may have similar rushing stats. It's just going to take him a bit longer to do it. But uh, enough about Deshaun Watson. Let's move on and talk about your uh, your next guy. <clears throat> All right, so why don't you tell us about Zach Ertz. What's your over-under for him? What's the question? My question for Zach Ertz is, will Zach Ertz be over or under 900 receiving yards this season? And I'm going to definitely say under. Zach Ertz, if you look at his season and his career, um, he's been in the league for five years. He's had three consecutive seasons with 74 plus receptions and three consecutive seasons with 800 yards receiving, but he's never cracked that 900 yard mark. Now, last year, as we all know, the Philadelphia Eagles did go on to win the Super Bowl. Zach Ertz had an amazing season. He had 74 catches for 824 yards and eight touchdowns. Here's the thing with that. The Eagles have a pretty good defense. And as we've talked about defense affecting the passing game, they only upgraded their defense by adding Michael Bennett to that, that middle linebacker position. And with an upgraded defense and now Jay Ajayi getting the full offensive playbook and being in his second year, Corey Clement being there, um, they're going to improve their running game as well. So with an improved defense, being ahead in most games, and having a solid running game, they're not going to really be throwing the ball as much. Now, <clears throat> Alshon Jeffrey also came out last year, and he had a slow start. He really picked it up towards the second half of the season, and he built a, a rapport with Carson Wentz. So I think Alshon Jeffrey is going to start stealing away some of those touchdowns. Um, not, I'm excuse me, not touchdowns, but uh, targets, and then also get more receptions. He only had like 63 catches last year. Um, Nelson Aguilar, another year, he's fully improved. So Wentz has a lot of weapons. He's going to be throwing the ball around, and but mostly they're going to be running the ball a little bit more. Now, they're obviously right now the number one threat. They didn't make any changes on offense. They made upgrades on defense, and they're the number one threat from the NFC to go back to the Super Bowl. But when you break it down like I did with Sammy Watkins, Zach Ertz would need to have the best season of his career statistically to break 900 yards. Now, he's already considered one of the top three tight ends in the league, but if you take his per-game statistics and his per-season statistics, he actually averages um, 11.41 yards per catch. He would need to hit over 80 catches, actually 80 catches exactly this season, to get 900 yards. Now, 900 yards would be his personal best, but he's never had 80 catches in a season. So I think his targets go down maybe 5% or so with that extra boost to the running game. Not as many passing uh, opportunities there. The offense is pretty much the same as far as uh, Doug Peterson still being there. Offense coordinator changed, obviously. Uh, um, I can't think of the... Uh, DeFilippo went, went to the Vikings, and uh, they lost him. So um, we're going to see what happens with that offensive coordinator situation but the playbook should pretty much be the same and um, I just don't see he is in the prime of his career but he's probably going to be right around that 70 to 75 catch mark and 750 to 850 yards again so I don't think he'll have the, the career best season that um, we would need to have here to get to 900 yards all right, yeah. Uh, you mentioned possibly a drop-off in about 5% in his targets simply because the running game's getting better. Um, my only thought and the one thing I have to say is um, the extra three games with Carson Wentz will probably more than make up for that 5% from that increase in the running game, um, simply having a better quarterback for more games. So I think that could definitely help him. But I definitely do agree with you. 900 yards is just a bit too much of a stretch for Zach Ertz. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if he got quite a bit of touchdowns. I mean, if you're playing the Eagles and they're in the goal line or the red zone, 
You need to go cover Alshon Jeffrey. You yep. need to cover Jai. If Corey Coleman's out there, you need to cover Coleman catching the ball in the backfield. Aguilar. You, you get, you, I'm, that's the other thing. Aguilar's pretty underrated. You can't leave him open. I mean, what do you cover? Especially with a tight end that plays Zach Ertz like he does. That's the sort of thing. That's the sort of way he plays. Um, I think he could have a lot of touchdowns, but definitely I'd be surprised if he had 900 yards. Well, and here's the thing you could you could argue for is the fact that they, they gave away Trey Burton. They let him go to the Bears. He got a huge contract there. He's going to have a great season, in, in my opinion. But, you know, Trey Burton had five touchdowns on only 31 catches – or 31 targets last year, 23 catches for five touchdowns. Now, that's not all going to go to Zach Ertz. They jumped ahead of the Cowboys because they knew Jason Witten was going to retire, and they went out and drafted another tight end to be the backup to Zach Ertz. So they're going to run some two tight end sets, and Ertz is not going to be the only guy out there available to catch the ball. All right, solid pick. Well, I suppose we can move on, and I'll talk about my last prompt here. Okay, so Ezekiel Elliott combines for 16 touchdowns. That's the question. A lot of people are enamored by Ezekiel Elliott. And so, the, you know what? Just do it right now. Go hate me in the comments. But I'm going to say under. I think he's going to get less than six com 16 combined touchdowns. And here's why. A lot of people would say, well, Christian, Christian, in his first 25 games, he's had 25 touchdowns. And if, you know, he gets combined for 16 touchdowns, we play 16 games. So that's the same ratio, one touchdown per game. Well, I don't think he's going to continue that. Let's just start by comparing him to some other great running backs that I think all of us can agree have similar talent or in that area. Um, we'll start with LaShawn McCoy. In 131 games played, LaShawn McCoy has 81 combined touchdowns. Um, Todd Gurley, in 44 games played, has 35 touchdowns. The Le'Veon Bell, I mean the man for many years now, has played 62 games, 42 combined touchdowns. No running back has been able to play three seasons or more and keep up that one-to-one -one ratio of one touchdown per game. The closest person is, who's really been able to do that is David Johnson. Now, David Johnson only played two full seasons, and he just missed the mark. 33 games, 32 touchdowns. To think that Ezekiel Elliott is going to come out and be the first running back to keep up that pace for a full three seasons... I think is a stretch to me, and here's why. I don't want to just say it's a stretch. I don't want to just say, well, it's never been done before, so it can't happen. So here are some more reasons why it won't happen. First of all, his yards per carry are alarming. His rookie year, it was at 5.1. Very impressive. 5.1 is just studly. Great. Comes out last year, however, drops horribly to 4.1. That's bad. I don't care what running back you are. That worries me. If Le'Veon Bell's yards per carry dropped to 4.1, I'd be concerned. Same with Todd Gurley, McCoy, Johnson, anybody else I just talked about. And so that's a major problem. And it may not be because of Ezekiel Elliott. People are saying, well, it's just the passing game struggle last year. I really don't care why. It doesn't matter why his yards per carry were down. It's down. And I think a lot of people think, well, the passing game was bad last year, but it'll be better this year. It'll be better. It won't be better. They lost Des Bryant, they lost Jason Witten, and who do they replace with? Hearns and Gallup. That's maybe an uh, equal trade-off. Maybe you're getting in two younger guys, but you're definitely not upgrading. I think that Hearns is a fairly good wide receiver, but Des Bryant certainly had his years. And we just don't know what to expect from Michael Gallup, especially from a team like Jason Witten. He really relied upon Jason Witten. The Titans have used him for years. I'll be curious to see what Dak Prescott can do without a tight end. So that's another concern. <clears throat> yeah, I mentioned in the last video, 44% of the targets are lost there between Witten and Bryant. So that passing game isn't going to improve yeah, a lot. Exactly. And here's my final concern. Let's look at the other guys I talked about. Le'Veon Bell, Todd Gurley, LaShawn McCoy, and David Johnson. Ryan, take a guess. What do they all have in common? Uh, they catch the ball a lot. They catch the ball a lot, and they get touchdowns. Like, man, those guys can catch the ball and score touchdowns. What can Ezekiel Elliott not do very well? Catch the ball a lot. Catch the ball a lot, <laughs> and that's a major concern for me. Uh, over his first two seasons, he's only averaged 29 receptions per year. That's essentially half or even less than half than basically everyone else on that list. In fact, Le'Veon Bell had like 85 catches last year. So he's nowhere near them. If he's going to combine for 16 touchdowns, then he's going to have to have a lot of receiving touchdowns or a lot of rushing touchdowns. I don't imagine he's going to be able to go out and run for 14 TDs. Um, 
So in my mind, he's going to need to have three or four or five receiving touchdowns. And Ryan, do you think that he's going to be able to do that? Because I'm going to say no. I'm going to go with no on the receiving touchdowns. I mean, it's a stretch. He might be able to hit that 14 rushing yard, rushing touchdown mark, but I don't know about the receiving touchdowns at all. Um, and that even with the 14 rushing touchdowns, that's going to be a lot. I mean, Kareem Hunt last year had an absolutely astonishing season, and he only had 13 total touchdowns. So um, we'll see what he can do. That's the thing. 11 or 12 rushing touchdowns by Elliott is what I'm expecting maybe two receiving touchdowns, a very solid season, but 16 combined touchdowns, it's not going to happen in my mind. I think that's a bit of a stretch. Now, um, I'm going to play the other side here, and uh, I know one of the stats that Rob has thrown out on us before is um, with Ezekiel Elliott. Oh, you know, I just had it and I lost it. I don't know. Um, I was going to talk about the offensive line, though. Um, Zach Martin getting that extension for six years. He is one of the highest paid offensive linemen. Um, they brought back uh, Ty- Tyron Smith. He was injured last year, so they should have him back. That could help out a little bit, but they still have Rod Smith, I believe, in the backfield catching the ball. He played a lot on third down last year. He had a couple of good games. Oh, here's what it was. Um, the one thing that Rob always mentioned is last year, you know, you were talking about his yards per per, uh, per rush going down to 4.1. Um, he was probably a little bit out of it, you know, never knowing when the suspension was going to go through, always having to worry about if he's going to play, if he's not going to play. So he couldn't really get his mental game into the... What do you feel about having a full 16-game load and being mentally prepared this season versus last? Well, you know, the argument comes in... You know, I like the argument. That's a great question. That's not a question of mentally prepared for me. Ryan, if I said you had to go play in the NFL right now, would you rather have four less weeks or four more weeks to prepare? Uh, Definitely more. You'd rather have more (laughs) weeks. If anything, the concern is physically... Um, last year, Le'Veon Bell was a preseason holdout. He was a contract holdout, and because of it, he struggled for his first two games. Mm-hmm. That happens. I wouldn't be. I wasn't surprised to see that. Easy, um, excuse me. I wouldn't be surprised whenever I see a guy like Ezekiel Elliott get suspended and then come back and struggle their first few games. But that really wasn't the case with Elliott. Physically, that wasn't the problem. And again, mentally, I don't see how having more time to get ready is an issue. Um, I don't know if that was actually the problem for him. Um, And to what you said about the offensive line, he has the same offensive line that he has had for years. So I don't also know if that's a concern. Um, Like I said, his rookie year and last year, he's had the same offensive line. It's not any worse or any better. And so I don't necessarily know if that's going to change anything. That's why I didn't mention it, although maybe I should have. Thank you for pointing that out. Sure. I like it. I like it. Definitely under 16 touchdowns on my end, too. All right. Well, as always, we thank you guys so much for watching. You guys have a great day and God bless.